guys and welcome to my all-in-one IGCSE Edexcel Biology video 921. This much requested video is finally here. I'm going to take you through hopefully every single spec point so that by the time you've watched it you can feel really confident about getting that grade 9. Don't forget my revision guides. I sell these online. They are my perfect answer revision guides. I have spent hundreds if not thousands of hours compiling these with their perfect questions, perfect answers and go check out my website www sciencewithhazel.co.uk where you can see previews and buy them. Let's get started however on this humongous video. We're going to start by looking at features that all living organisms have in common and lots of people call that Mrs. Nag or Mrs. Gren. So remember if they say give some features that all living organisms share you're going to say movement, respiration, sensitivity, you're going to say nutrition, excretion, uh, reproduction and growth and that just means getting bigger so if it's non-living like a virus you can easily say it does not move it does not respire it does not excrete so just list any of the Mrs. Nug factors and you will get the marks now we're going to look at the plant and animal cell very basic biology here first of all let's start by the, listing the organelles that both animal and plant cells share so remember they both have cell membranes cytoplasm nuclei or nucleus they have ribosomes, mitochondria. Now, in terms of the plant cell, there's a few extra organelles you need to list. That's the cell wall, the vacuole, and also chloroplasts. We now need to look at the role of each of those organelles in turns. So because it's so key that you get these really basic questions right in your exam, because if they say, what does the nucleus do, you need to be able to write that. So what does the nucleus do? It controls the activities of the cell. What does the cytoplasm do? It's where chemical reactions take place. What is the role of the cell membrane? It controls what enters and leaves the cell. What is the role of ribosomes? And that this is new for this specification. It's where protein synthesis takes place, i.e. it's where proteins are made. Looking more closely at the plant cell now, what is the role of the cell wall? First of all, state that the cell wall is made out of cellulose and that it protects and supports the cell. The vacuole, remember that's filled with cell sap, which also helps to maintain the structure of the cell. Lastly, chloroplasts, remember they're full of a green pigment called chlorophyll. It gives leaves the green colour, and that's where photosynthesis takes place. A couple of tricky words you may have come across is eukaryote and prokaryote. Don't worry, it's just a very posh way of describing the type of cell we're talking about. Eukaryotes are all animal cells as we know it, and that's because they contain membrane-bound organelles such as nuclei, mitochondria, etc. So an animal cell, like I said, is an example of a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotes, we're talking about viruses and bacteria here because they contain no membrane-bound organelles. So they contain no nuclei, which we know because they contain strands of DNA or RNA instead. So we now need to take lots of different types of cell in turn and know quite a lot of information about them. So I'm going to start with the bacterial cell. We can see from the diag diagram that a bacterial cell has a cell wall. Sometimes it has a slime capsule around the edge. Sometimes it has a flagella, which is a tail that helps the bacteria to move. As I've already said, it doesn't have a distinct nucleus. Instead, it has a circular chromosome, which we call a nucleoid. It has other small rings of genetic material. We call these plasmids. And that, remember, is important when we talk about genetic engineering. Then you find more typical things such as cytoplasm and cell membranes. In terms of things like whether they're pathogenic or non-pathogenic, remember that they can be both. So a pathogen is a microorganism that causes disease. It makes sense, therefore, that some bacteria are pathogenic. Such examples include pneumococcus, which is responsible for pneumonia, tuberculosis, remember that gives people TB where they cough up blood, very horrible disease. However, some bacteria are very useful, like those used in yogurt making. The example here is Lactobacillus bulgaricus. You remember lastly that bacteria are unicellular, which means that they're made of one cell only. Looking at viruses now, because that leads on quite nicely from bacteria, these are very, very small things. They're much smaller than bacteria. They're far more simple because they're simply made out of a protein coat, which surrounds either DNA or RNA. They don't have any of the typical organelles you would find in other types of cell. The crucial thing here, as I've already said, is that they're non-living. They do not excrete, they do not respire, they do not grow. 
they're always pathogenic. There's no such thing as a good virus. They're always out to hurt you. And examples here include the flu virus, the cold virus, HIV, which is very famous because it causes AIDS. A new virus you need to know about is tobacco mosaic virus, which causes discoloration in plant leaves. And that's due to the fact it prevents chloroplast formation. Next up, we're looking at the protoctists. This is known as the dustbin kingdom. Lots of various organisms which don't fit into the other categories fit into Protoctis. Some of them have animal cell properties, some of them have plant cell properties. Starting with algae and also corella. These both have chloroplasts, which means they're more plant-like. Things like amoeba are more animal-like. You'll see that they don't have chloroplasts, they don't have a cell wall as such. And they all use diffusion in order to obtain their nutrients and get their oxygen. One key one you need to know about is plasmodium. This is pathogenic because it causes the disease malaria. And the plasmodium is the small protoctist that lives in the female mosquito's bodies and that's what she injects when she bites you. So that's actually what gives you malaria. Do note that they can either be unicellular or multicellular, so made up of one cell or many cells. Fungi now. Now fungi, they're quite easy because you can draw literally a plant cell but just make it slightly more circular. So it has the same organelles you would find in a plant cell apart from the fact it obviously doesn't have chloroplasts, but it does have a cell wall. This is made out of chitin, you do need to know that. It has a cell membrane, cytoplasm, it has a vacuole. Now there are lots of different examples of fungi including mucor and mushrooms. One thing you do need to just be able to mention, this is a case where you just shove in some keywords and it doesn't even matter if they don't even make sense, I'll give you a mark as long as you mention it. They have things called hyphae, which are thread-like structures which form a network called mycelium. Do notice that fungi carry out saprotrophic nutrition, and that means that they extracellularly secrete enzymes onto dead matter, which it breaks down and then absorbs as its food. Crucial words here are extracellularly secreting enzymes, which break down dead matter, and that's how they actually obtain their food. There are some useful examples of fungi, including yeast, now remember that's used in beer and bread making. Why? Because when yeast undergoes anaerobic respiration, that means respiration without oxygen, it breaks down glucose into ethanol, which is clearly used in beer making, and also carbon dioxide. And it's those bubbles of carbon dioxide that actually help that bread to rise. If we're going to use the correct nomenclature when we're talking about naming things, we can talk about the five kingdoms, and that consists of plants, animals, protoctis, bacteria, and fungi. One small thing to notice, which can always catch you out, is how carbohydrates are stored. So in animals it's stored as glycogen, in plants it tends to be stored as starch, things like potatoes are very starch heavy, and then in fungi it's stored as glycogen also. Now we're going to look at organisation within organisms, so we're looking at key definitions. The crucial thing here is to just learn one definition and then just use it as a template for all your other definitions. So I'll explain what I'm talking about right now. So if we start, we look at a cell. Now remember cells are full of organelles, which I've just listed, nucleus, cell membrane, etc. So what is a cell? Well, it's a group of organelles working together to perform the same function. We're going up a step further. So we're now looking at tissue. What is a tissue? It's a group of cells working together to perform the same function. Then we're going to look at organs. So what is an organ? It's a group of tissues working together to perform the same function. And lastly, what is an organ system? It's a group of organs working together to perform the same function. And lastly, what is an organism? Well, it's a group of organ systems working together to perform the same function. Now I need to list all the various organ systems within the body, which I've always been really bad at remembering all of them, so I'm going to try. There's the digestive system, there's the endocrine system, reproductive system, circulatory system, respiratory system, nervous system, and excretory system. But if we focus in on the digestive system, for example, we could first of all take the fact that the digestive system is obviously the system, so what organs make up that digestive system, that organ system? Well, it's things like the stomach, esophagus, pancreas, small intestine, large intestine. Then we look and look at the tissues. So for example, in the stomach, you've got glandular tissue, which secretes hydrochloric acid. You've got muscular tissue, which helps churn the food. Don't worry too much about this detail, by the way. I just want you to get the full picture so you're not thrown off if a question's slightly strange in the exam. 
and then you can obviously look at the cellular level within the stomach and the organelles so it's a big hierarchy really. So we're now going to look at a zygote. So what is a zygote? Now remember that when the sperm and egg meet at fertilization, then you're going to form one cell. That cell is called the zygote. And an enzyme is a biological catalyst. This means that it speeds up the rate of a chemical reaction without being used up. Now an enzyme has a very special part on it called an active site and that's the biologically active part of the molecule and what happens is the substrate molecule binds to that active site, it forms an enzyme substrate complex which then splits up to form the useful product that we're after. And we're going to talk now about digestive enzymes because I think it makes sense for us to look at the various products and substrates involved in digestion. So there are various enzymes you need to be aware of. Firstly, amylase, and notice the enzymes tend to end in ASE, so A's. Amylase is made in the salivary glands in your small intestine and your pancreas. And what amylase does is it catalyzes the breakdown of starch into glucose. So in this case, starch is the substrate, it's the thing entering the enzyme, which is amylase, and then the product here is glucose. So what you can see is a very large sugar is broken down using amylase into a much smaller, simpler sugar called glucose. Now we need to look at protease. This is more straightforward because as the name suggests, it breaks down proteins. So protein is the substrate and it breaks down proteins into amino acids. These are the products and protease is found in your stomach, in your small intestine and your pancreas. The last enzyme you need to be aware of is lipase. Lipase breaks down lipids or fats is their more colloquial name and lipids are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. So do try and remember that's the most complicated one. Now we need to just touch on enzyme activity. So the two things you can alter is both the temperature and the pH. So if you look at this graph, you can see at low temperatures, the enzyme activity is low. The reason for this is all to do with chemistry, it's to do with collision theory, because at low temperatures, enzymes have very little kinetic energy as do the substrate molecules, so it means that the enzymes and substrate aren't coming into contact very often. That means they obviously can't bind at the active site, and so the reaction can't be catalyzed. Catalyzed? Catalyzed. As we increase the temperature, you can see the enzyme activity increases. That's because those molecules are coming together more often, and at 37 degrees, as is the case with most animals, you will find that enzyme activity has reached its peak. It is at its optimum temperature, the best temperature, and that means the enzymes and the substrates are coming together very frequently. After this temperature and above this temperature, we see a massive decrease in enzyme activity, and that's because the enzyme has become denatured. Never say the word killed, they're not living, they can't be killed, you need to say they're denatured. And what that means is that the enzyme's active site has changed shape, meaning that the substrate can no longer fit. If we take a look at pH now, you can see a very distinctive graph shape here, and that's because enzymes have different optimum pHs. And if the pH is either too high or too low around that optimum pH, you'll find that the enzyme denatures, which is why you have that cone shape. Because let's look at the enzyme which has an optimum pH of 7. If you go to 6.5 or 7.5, the enzyme will denature. And this is true for all enzymes. Some enzymes prefer different pHs to other ones. So proteases in the stomach, for example, because they're surrounded by hydrochloric acid, they'll have an optimum pH of approximately 3, whereas throughout the rest of the digestive system, you find a slightly alkaline optimum pH, so around 8, which is why you can't take stomach protease and put it in the small intestine and expect it to be okay. Now we're moving on to transport, so let's first of all touch on the three types of transport. So we're looking at diffusion, osmosis and active transport. So you need to know the definitions of these terms in great amount of detail. Now remember with diffusion, it's the net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So that's the reason why you spray perfume in one side of the room where there's a high concentration of perfume particles and it moves across to the other side of the room where you can smell it. That is by diffusion, it is a passive process, it does not require energy. Osmosis is very similar to diffusion, however it involves the movement of water, which is why our definition this time is osmosis is the net movement of water from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential 
across a partially permeable membrane. Now, potential is just a really posh way of saying concentration. So somewhere where there's lots of water to somewhere where there's little water. And do add that it's across a partially permeable membrane. If there's no partially permeable membrane, it's not osmosis, it's just diffusion. So notice when water leaves the stomata from that leaf, that is by diffusion because stomata is a whole, not a partially permeable membrane. Lastly, active transport. As the name suggests, it's an active process. This means it requires energy. The reason being is because it's the net movement from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration so against the concentration gradient. Let's touch on amoeba now. Remember the amoeba is an example of a protoctis. This is a single-celled organism which can use diffusion in order to obtain all the nutrients it needs. So oxygen diffuses from outside that amoeba into the amoeba from an area of high concentration surrounding the amoeba to a low concentration inside the amoeba. The reason why diffusion is appropriate is because it occurs very quickly because the amoeba is single-celled, which means it has a large surface area to volume ratio, and therefore the speed of diffusion is fast enough to allow oxygen in as and when it is required. But larger organisms, which are multicellular, have a much smaller surface area to volume ratio. Diffusion is not suitable, it is too slow, which is why they develop the need for a circulatory system. Right, we're going to be talking about all things to do with plants, starting with that key plant process, photosynthesis. Remember photosynthesis is carried out in the chloroplasts of plant cells. They contain chlorophyll, which absorbs that sunlight and actually carries out the process of photosynthesis. And this is the method by which green plants make their own food. So let's start by looking at the word equation for photosynthesis. Remember that it's carbon dioxide plus water forms glucose and oxygen. This is why it's such a great process because of the huge volume of oxygen photosynthesis releases. In terms of the balanced symbol equation, try and learn this off by heart and remember that six is very important. So you've got six CO2 plus six H2O forms C6H12O6 plus six O2. Now, unfortunately, there are lots of different factors which can act to reduce or limit the rate of photosynthesis and we call these limiting factors. You need to know the definition of a limiting factor. It's a factor which in a reaction is in the shortest supply and a lack of this factor is the reason why a rate of reaction no longer increases. Now in terms of photosynthesis, there are three limiting factors you need to know about. These are carbon dioxide, light, intensity and temperature. So any one of these may act to limit how much photosynthesis can take place and we're going to talk about each of these in turn in a different situation. So let's think about early morning. We have a green plant and it's trying to photosynthesize in early morning, but what could be limiting how much photosynthesis takes place? Well, it's early morning, so it's quite cold, so obviously temperature is going to be a limiting factor here. Another limiting factor will most likely be light intensity because it's not as light early morning as it is at midday. So despite carbon dioxide levels increasing, you will find that low light levels low temperatures limit the rate of photosynthesis. The reason being is that in the morning, low temperatures obviously mean low kinetic energy, so all those enzymes involved in those chemical reactions involved in photosynthesis can't actually come together, they don't collide as frequently with their substrate molecules, and that's all because of little kinetic energy. If we take midday now, we know that the temperature will have increased, we know that the light levels will increase, so neither of these things will be limiting factors. The most likely limiting factor in midday will be carbon dioxide levels. And be sure that you can look at graphs on all of these factors and make sure you understand what is going on. Carrying on with the plant theme, we're now going to look at the structure of a leaf and how it is adapted for photosynthesis. Let's make some generic comments at the beginning by stating that a leaf has a large surface area, which is obvious so that it can absorb more light. It's thin, so the gases don't have to diffuse too far. Looking very closely now at the structure of the leaf, you need to be able to label all those layers and discuss which each of them do, and you need to be very specific here. So we're gonna start with the waxy cuticle. The waxy cuticle is there to prevent transpiration, and remember that transpiration is the loss of water from the leaf. So a nice thick waxy cuticle prevents excess water loss. Next up we have the upper epidermis. Remember this is transparent and it allows light to enter the leaf 
You don't need to say anything more than that. The layer beneath this is the palisade mesophyll. Mesophyll is just a fancy way of saying tissue. The palisade mesophyll is what your generic plant cell looks like. So it's your rectangle block. It's crammed full of chloroplasts, so it contains lots of chloroplasts for photosynthesis, and this is where photosynthesis takes place. Under this, you have the spongy mesophyll. The important thing to note here is the presence of plenty of air spaces, which allow gases such as carbon dioxide and oxygen to diffuse. You'll also find the vein here, and the vein contains the xylem and the phloem. The xylem brings water into the leaf. The phloem transports sugar away from the leaf. Then we have the lower epidermis. Not a lot to say here. The next layer is the most important layer, and that contains the guard cells and the stomata. Now the guard cells control whether the stomata are open or closed and the stomata allow carbon dioxide into the leaf and oxygen and water to leave the leaf. So we know photosynthesis is the method by which plants make food and they make that in the form of glucose. So what do they do with that glucose? Well remember that glucose contains carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So it obviously contains components that can be used to make other biological molecules and this includes fats and proteins, so that glucose is used to make fats and proteins. It's used to make storage compounds, such as starch, which the plant can call upon in lean times, and it's also used to make the sugar cellulose, which is an important component of plant cell walls because it gives it its structural integrity. Relating to the plant mineral ions, luckily you don't need to know too much, just learn the role of nitrates and magnesium. So the mineral ions are present in the soil around the roots of the plant and the plant obviously needs them to be healthy. So it absorbs both magnesium and nitrates by active transport, so against the concentration gradient, and it uses the nitrates to build proteins and it uses the magnesium to manufacture the chlorophyll found in chloroplasts. You need to know some deficiency signs, so with magnesium clearly you won't be able to manufacture chloroplasts or chlorophyll anymore, so you see yellow leaves, and if you've got a lack of nitrates you will see a stunted, poorly grown plant, so it's very short. Now we need to look at digestion. Let's first of all discuss the definition of digestion, which is that it's the breakdown of large insoluble molecules into small soluble ones. The reason being that we need to take our food into our mouth and we need to break it down into teeny tiny pieces, change its structure so that it can be absorbed through the walls of the small intestine. So that's what we're on about when we're talking about digestion. Now I've already told you about chemical digestion, which relates to enzymes entirely because that's totally altering the structure of the food molecule. We need to also look at mechanical digestion, which is a far more physical process that involves just chopping that food up into smaller pieces but it doesn't alter the structure of that food. So if we think about where mechanical digestion takes place, it will be in the mouth, your teeth chew, it will also be in your stomach where your muscular walls churn that food up and break it up into smaller chunks. So we'll start at the mouth. So I've already said we've got physical digestion from the teeth, chemical digestion comes from amylase which digests starch into glucose. The food then passes down the food pipe, which we're going to have to call the esophagus, and peristalsis is a process whereby the muscular contractions of the esophageal wall force that bolus, that ball of food, down into your stomach. Here, muscular contractions of the stomach lining help churn the food. You've got the secretion of hydrochloric acid. This has two jobs. It breaks down the food and it also destroys pathogens. And that's the reason why you don't get sick all the time if you eat some slightly dodgy food. Sometimes the food you've eaten is so dodgy that you still get sick. But for the most part, you'll find your stomach acid will destroy those pathogens. Remember, a pathogen is a microorganism which causes disease. Protease is secreted. That breaks down proteins into amino acids. At this point, the stomach empties and the food flows into the small intestine well, there'll be further peristalsis contractions. I don't know if that's the exact version of the word peristalsis, but it's similar enough, which force the food along. We've got more enzymes being added here, lipase, protease, and amylase. And note that they'll have a differing optimum pH from the protease in the stomach. They'll have a much higher optimum pH. We need to mention bile now. Now, bile is an interesting substance. I think it's green. It's made in the liver. You must remember that. It's stored in the gallbladder and it's released into the small intestine. And it has two main jobs. 
First of all, bile is an emulsifier, and what that means is that it breaks up large fat droplets into smaller fat droplets. Why? Because it creates a much larger surface area, because small droplets have a much larger surface area than large droplets, and that means that lipase can work more easily on the lipid molecules, on the fat molecules. But if you can't bother to write all that, just say that it emulsifies. Its second role is to neutralise stomach acid. It brings up the pH to an alkaline pH, approximately 7 or 8, and what that does is it means that those enzymes that have been released into the small intestine don't get denatured by all the acidic food coming along. So that's bile's two main jobs, to emulsify and to neutralise. So at this point we've done lots of digesting. Our food molecules are very small, they're very soluble, which means they can now pass through the walls of the small intestine into the bloodstream. They often ask you what the adaptations are of the small intestine lining, so you're going to talk about villi primarily. So remember villi are these structures shaped like this and they provide a very large surface area for absorption and that's also maximised by the presence of microvilli. This video is so um, detailed, it's making me lose my voice. <clears throat> so yeah, microvilli help increase the surface area further. You've got a short diffusion distance, you've got a plentiful supply of blood capillaries and you've also got the presence of lacteals, which are for fat absorption. So the small intestine is extremely adapted for its role. So once all that food has been absorbed and you've just got the leftover undigestible food, it passes into the large intestine and here water is reabsorbed into the blood. Lastly, the faeces, because we're now at the faeces stage, that's the fancy word for poo, the faeces are stored in the rectum before they pass out of your body via the anus. We call this egestion, the removal of faeces from the anus, not to be confused with excretion. You do not excrete faeces, you egest them. Excretion has a def different definition. It is the removal of waste products of metabolism. And just to touch on a couple more definitions, ingestion is the taking in of food into the body and metabolism is the rate at which chemical reactions take place in the body and lastly, assimilation is building up large molecules from small molecules. Right, that was a really detailed video. I hope you found it helpful. Moving on to humans now, we're looking at balanced diet. So we need to look at the various nutrients that you need for a balanced diet, their roles within the body, the foods that they're found in, and any deficiency diseases. So let's have a look and start by listing these nutrients. So we're looking at carbohydrates, fats, proteins, minerals, vitamins, water and fibre. I hope I've listed them all. So starting with carbohydrates. Foods which contain lots of carbohydrates include things like bread and rice and pasta. Carbohydrates are an important source of energy. Proteins now. Now you find lots of protein in meat such as chicken and beef. Protein is important for the growth and repair of muscles. Now remember lots of people take protein shakes to the gym, why? Because they're trying to build their muscles at the same time so that they like to take a source of protein. So try and remember it from that point of view. If you have a lack of protein, you get a really horrible disease called kwashiorkor. People are seeing very distinctive, all like stomachs, where your stomach comes out super far, and that's a symptom of kwashiorkor. Fats, foods which contain a lot of fat include dairy foods such as butter and cream. I'm just giving you a few examples, it's not exhaustive. Now fats are a very concentrated source of energy and they provide insulation, i.e. they help to keep you warm. Moving on to some specific examples of vitamins. So vitamin C, you find this in citrus fruits such as oranges and lemons. Vitamin C is important for the repair of tissues so it helps to stick together the cells in the lining of your mouth and if you don't have enough vitamin C you get a disease called scurvy which was um, infamous in the 1500s when sailors used to go out to sea, they never got enough oranges and lemons and then you'd see very ca characteristic mouth bleeds. So scurvy is the deficiency disease and the way to get rid of that is by eating lots of oranges and lemons. Vitamin D now, now vitamin D is important for strong bones. You find it in fish liver oils, which is gross, I hate cod liver oil, but it's also manufactured by the action of the sun on the skin, so you can get a lot of vitamin D sunbathing, but obviously not too much, don't get burnt. That's not a good idea either. And lack of vitamin D leads to rickets in children. Then we need to talk about vitamin A. Vitamin A is important for good vision in dim light. Lack of vitamin A leads to night blindness. 
You find it in fish oils again, liver, so lots of pleasant things to be eating, and also in margarine. Now we're going to move on to minerals such as iron. Iron is found in red meat and spinach. It's important for healthy blood. It's a really important component of haemoglobin, which is found in red blood cells. Lack of iron leads to anemia, which is when you feel really tired and exhausted all the time. And lastly, calcium. Calcium is a mineral which is important for strong teeth and bones. It's found in dairy products such as milk. Lack of calcium will also lead to rickets. Last two things, fibre. So fibre is essential to help food move through your digestive system. Without fibre, you're liable to get constipation. Vegetables and fruit contain a lot of fibre. And water, water we know we need to survive. Without it, we would die very quickly, and that's because it supports all the chemical reactions that take place in our bodies. Now, an important side note is to notice that we need a balanced diet full of all these nutrients in order to stay healthy. But obviously our requirements will vary depending on our age. So older people will need less food, less of each of these nutrients compared with teenagers, for example. Pregnant women, they'll need more because they're supporting the growing fetus. Teenage girls will need more iron because they've started their periods. People who exercise will need more protein to help them with the growth and repair of their muscles. So it's a bit of a common sense part of the specification, but just be aware that there are differing requirements. The next topic we need to tackle is respiration, both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Remember it's the process carried out in mitochondria, which releases energy. New for your specification is the fact that ATP is produced, and all ATP is is a posh way of describing the energy store that is created as a result of respiration. So what is this ATP used for? Well, it's used in cell division. It's used to build up large molecules from small molecules. It's used in active transport. And it's used to contract our muscles. Let's look at the equation for aerobic respiration now. So you need to take oxygen into the body. You need to add that to glucose, an arrow. And then what's produced is carbon dioxide and water and energy is released. Again, you need the balance symbol equation here, and it's again all the sixes. I hope you've noticed that photosynthesis and respiration are the same equation, just reversed. So in terms of the balance symbol equation, you're looking at C6H12O6 plus 6O2 arrow 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus energy in a square bracket, if you so wish. Now aerobic respiration involves the use of oxygen, and that's the type of respiration that we carry out ordinarily. Now, sometimes we have to carry out anaerobic respiration, which tends to be when we've exercised and when we can't take enough oxygen into our bodies. And this involves the incomplete breakdown of glucose. And we find that lactate is produced instead. Now, lactate is pretty poisonous. It's what gives our muscles cramp, and we need to remove that lactate. So we have to take in more oxygen which we call the oxygen debt in order to break down that lactate to ensure the glucose is completely broken down. Now there are two places where anaerobic respiration takes place that you need to know about. So I've already mentioned one, which is in your muscles. So I've given you all that information about the oxygen debt. It's when you can't take enough oxygen into your body and that's because you've been doing something pretty strenuous like sprinting. You also need to know about anaerobic respiration in yeast Remember that yeast is a type of fungus and yeast anaerobically respires and it breaks down glucose into ethanol plus carbon dioxide. And these are very useful industrial processes because remember the carbon dioxide is used to help bread rise and that the ethanol is used in beer making. Moving on to the breathing system. So we are looking at our lungs and all the vessels relating to that. So we're going to start with our mouth. It leads down to our windpipe, which we're going to have to call the trachea. The trachea branches to form two bronchi. Further branching occurs, which is the bronchioles, and that ends in lots of air sacs, which we call alveoli, and they're surrounded by a network of blood capillaries. Now, if you actually think about it, it is very much like a tree because the trachea is represented by the trunk. The big branches are the bronchi, smaller branches are the bronchioles, the alveoli are similar to the leaves. So do bear that in mind. Now, we need to talk about how those bronchi and bronchioles are kept clean. That's due to the presence of two types of cell, the goblet cell and the ciliated cell. The goblet cell, first of all, secretes mucus. 
That mucus is good because it traps bacteria, pathogens, and it stops them from entering your lungs. This is when the cilia come in because remember they have hair-like projections which waft and they waft that mucus which is covered in bacteria up to your mouth where it can be swallowed and destroyed by your stomach acid. Now what is ventilation? Well that's simply taking air into and out of your lungs. Let's look in great depth now at an inhalation, so a breath in. So first of all the external intercostal muscles contract, the ribs move up and out, the diaphragm contracts and what this means is that it flattens and together all these processes increase the volume within your thorax. Because there's an increased volume, clearly the pressure will decrease because the same amount of air is now present in a larger volume and this means that air will be sucked into your lungs, causing your lungs to inflate. Now we want to take an exhalation, we want to breathe out, so the opposite takes place. This time the internal intercostal muscles contract, the ribs move down and in, the diaphragm relaxes, this has the effect of reducing the volume inside the thorax, the pressure increases relative to the pressure outside the body and therefore air is sucked out of your lungs and your lungs deflate. A small thing on looking at the composition of gases in your lungs, clearly air that you inhale will contain more oxygen than the air you exhale. Why? Because the whole point of breathing in is to get oxygen into your lungs so it can diffuse into your blood and then be taken around your body for respiration. Respiration obviously produces carbon dioxide, which is why when you breathe out, the air contains more carbon dioxide than the air you breathed in. Looking more closely at the alveoli, because this is where gas exchange takes place, where oxygen moves into the blood, carbon dioxide leaves, we need to look at the adaptations of alveoli for gas exchange. So clearly they have a very large surface area, they are thin, which gives you a short diffusion distance for that oxygen and carbon dioxide to move across. They are moist, which helps the gases to dissolve. And I can't think of anything else. So that is the adaptations of alveoli done. Let's look at transport in plants. So we're going to start by looking at two vessels, two tissues you need to know lots about. That is the xylem and the phloem. Make sure you can label these both inside the root at cross section and inside the stem. Note that in the root, the X matches with the xylem, which is why the X in the middle of the root is xylem. That's a nice way of remembering. Whereas the circles around that X are the phloem. Inside the stem, it's slightly different. The outer layer of tissue is the phloem. The inner layer is the xylem. Try and remember this because the phloem transports sugar and aphids are little insects which bite into that stem in order to steal some food, so they're biting in so that they can reach that flow and they take the food, so the flow is on the outside of the stem. So looking more closely at the rolls, as I've already told you, flow transports glucose, and it transports it from the leaves where it's made in photosynthesis to other parts of the plant, so to growing regions such as flowers and the tops of stems, and to storage regions such as the roots, and that's where it's stored as starch. Xylem transports water this time and mineral ions from the roots where it's absorbed through the root hair cells up the plant to the leaves in various places. So this is an important thing for you to note. Xylem only transports water upwards, phloem transports both up and down the plant. In terms of the structures, because xylem is transporting water and mineral ions, it needs to be very strong and notice that it's made out of dead cells which are stacked on top of each other so there's no organelles in there obstructing the flow of water. There's also lignin which helps to reinforce those walls further. Phloem has a different structure, just list some keywords here, don't talk too much about it. It has sieve plate tubes and it has companion cells and those companion cells contain lots of mitochondria so that they can release energy so that sugar can be actively transported in and out of the phloem. Let's now look at transport in animals, so primarily we're looking at the blood here. So we're going to start by looking at the components of blood. That will be red blood cells, white blood cells, plasma and platelets. Now remember plasmid is that liquid which actually acts as a suspension, it carries these various cells around the body. What sorts of things are transported in plasma? These are going to be our products from digestion, so things like glucose, 
amino acids, so soluble products. There'll also be hormones being transported. There'll be urea from the liver, which needs to be taken to the kidneys so it can be excreted, and carbon dioxide. Looking more closely at red blood cells, we need to look at the structure of red blood cells so we can see how they're so well adapted for their function. They have a biconcave dish shape. This means they're donut shaped, and what this does is it maximizes the surface area to volume ratio, ensuring that they can transport as much oxygen as possible. The absence of a nucleus also means that there's more room for oxygen. And do mention that they contain a pigment called hemoglobin. Remember, iron is needed for for haemoglobin production, I mentioned that earlier in balanced diet, and that haemoglobin binds to oxygen, forming oxyhemoglobin. Next topic, white blood cells and the immune system. So let's first of all discuss how we prevent pathogen entry in the first place. So remember our skin acts as a barrier, our hydrochloric acid in our stomach helps to destroy pathogens, our tears prevent pathogens entering our eyes, and also your eyelashes. But what happens once those pathogens actually enter our body, enter our bloodstream, clearly we can't stay ill forever and ever and ever. So there are mechanisms in place which actually act to remove those pathogens. The two mechanisms you need to know about are white blood cells and they are the phagocytes and the lymphocytes. So starting with the phagocytes, remember that they engulf or ingest pathogens by enclosing them inside a vacuole and then digestive enzymes are secreted which destroy the pathogen. The second type of white blood cell is the lymphocyte. The lymphocyte is far more complicated and it works by recognising the antigen on the pathogen. It secretes lots of antibodies which destroy that specific pathogen and in this way the pathogen is destroyed. Now it has various modes of action which help to increase the pathogen destruction. First of all it labels the pathogen making it easier for the phagocyte to recognise it and therefore engulf it. It neutralizes any toxins produced by the pathogen and it also causes the bacterial cell to burst open on occasion. Lastly, it makes the pathogens stick together. With that answer relating to the lymphocytes, notice that I use lots of keywords, antigens, antibodies, for example. Try and include as many keywords as possible. Just shove them in your answer because if you look at mark schemes, they'll be underlined as being worth a mark each. So it's worth writing them in anyway. Don't just keep repeating yourself. You need to insert lots and lots of keywords here. So we've talked all about the blood. Now we're going to talk about the circulatory system. So we need to look at the heart. I've already talked a little bit about multicellular versus unicellular organisms. The reason why organisms such as ourselves, humans, require a circulatory system is because our surface area to volume ratio is too small and diffusion is too slow. So we need a circulatory system which actually acts to transport oxygen around our bodies. So that's the reason why we have a circulatory system. The heart forms the epicentre of our circulatory system. It is the pump which delivers oxygen around our bodies. And you've got to know detailed information about how this actually happens. So we're going to divide the heart into four. Do remember that we switch over the left and right sides when we're looking at a diagram. Why? Because we're picking up the heart and pushing it into our bodies. So it is the opposite way around if you actually think about it. So the four chambers are the left atrium, right atrium. They form the top two chambers. Left ventricle and right ventricle form the bottom two chambers. Now do remember that pulmonary means relating to the lungs. So if you have used the word pulmonary, it means that blood must be flowing either to or from the lungs. So we're going to start by picking up oxygen in the lungs. It's going to be delivered to the heart, to the left atrium, via the pulmonary vein. Remember that veins bring blood to the heart, arteries take it away. So the pulmonary vein delivers oxygenated blood to the left atrium. The left atrium contracts, forcing blood into the left ventricle. Do you remember that the valves open here and they are the bicuspid valves they open to allow blood to flow from the atria to the ventricles. The left ventricle contracts, forcing blood into an artery. This is the aorta. It is the main artery delivering oxygenated blood around the body. So that blood goes and delivers oxygen. The oxygen is removed and used by respiring cells. Clearly the blood will now be deoxygenated and it needs to return to the heart so it can be pumped on further to the lungs. So it's going to return to the heart via a vein. The vein is the vena cava and it's going to take blood into the right atrium. 
The right atrium contracts, forcing blood through the tricuspid valves into the right ventricles. The right ventricle contracts, forcing blood into an artery. This artery is clearly going to be flowing to the lungs so the blood can be oxygenated and this is why it is the pulmonary artery. So that's our overview of blood flow around the body. Let's notice a couple of things about the heart. Firstly, that the walls of the ventricles are thicker than the walls of the atria. Why? Because they need to pump at a much higher pressure to deliver the blood much further. After all, they're delivering blood to both the lungs and the rest of the body. All the atria are doing is pumping to deliver the blood slightly lower, a couple of centimetres lower into the ventricles. Why is the wall of the left ventricle thicker than that of the right? Again, it's a distance thing. Blood from the left ventricle is going all around the body. Blood from the right ventricle is simply returning to the lungs. Your heart is here, your lungs are here. It's not too far. Why do we call this system a double circulatory system? Well, that's because the blood passes twice into the heart for every once it travels around the body. Simpler organisms such as fish have a single loop, so the blood just keeps passing from the gills to the heart around the body, round and round and round. Um, they're not as efficient as, at oxygenating their bodies as we are. You've got to know quite a lot about the various vessels that travel around the body. Just remember that arteries carry blood away from the heart and do remember that pulmonary means relating to the lungs and that hepatic means relating to the liver, renal means relating to the kidneys, so renal failure, kidney failure, hepatitis, disease of the liver. So these words, if you do know what they mean, it really helps because then when we're looking at what's the name of the vessel supplying the liver, well it's hepatic, it's coming from the heart, which means it's an artery, so it's the hepatic artery. What is the name of the blood vessel entering the kidneys? Well it's coming from the heart, so it's an artery, it's going to the kidneys, so it's renal, so it's the renal artery. The vessels leaving the organs, well, these have obviously got to return to the heart to become oxygenated, so they're going to be veins, so the vessel leaving the liver will be the hepatic vein. Just note the hepatic portal vein, that's just um, the name of the vessel which shunts blood from the digestive system to the liver, and that's the only weird one you need to know about. Looking at coronary heart disease now, the coronary arteries, coronary means relating to the heart. So the heart has its own special network of vessels which supply the heart with its own supply of oxygen. It can't actually obtain its oxygen needs from the blood flowing through it. It has to have its own special set of vessels. We call these the coronary arteries. And they're famous because this is how people get heart attacks. They get blocked, they get obstructed. And it does mean that oxygen can't reach the heart muscle, so part of it dies, which is what a heart attack is. So first of all, what factors increase your chance of getting coronary heart disease? So that could be a sedentary lifestyle, so lack of exercise. It could be your diet, eating diets high in fat and sugar. It could be inheritance, so genes. Some people are just more susceptible than others because of genes that they've received from their parents. It could be diabetes. Diabetes and coronary heart disease are very closely linked. Stress as well. People shouldn't get too stressed because that can put a strain on their heart too. In terms of what happens in coronary heart disease, how a heart attack might occur, what you find is that fatty deposits get offloaded in the walls of the coronary arteries. This obstructs the blood, meaning that less oxygen can reach those respiring cells. Because they're not receiving enough oxygen, they have to anaerobically respire. Remember that produces lactate, which slowly poisons the muscle cells, and then eventually there isn't enough oxygen, so the heart dies and those cells die. Let's look at how a heart rate increase is brought about during exercise, for example. So clearly when you exercise, you're going to produce more carbon dioxide. Why? Because your muscles are respiring more. So that carbon dioxide flows in the blood and it is detected by both the aorta and the carotid artery. This sends impulses or messages to the brain, particularly the medulla part of the brain, and specifically the accelerator nerve. Now that accelerator nerve causes an increase in heart rate so that more oxygen can be delivered to your muscles and so that more carbon dioxide can be removed. Looking now at the structure of arteries, veins and capillaries. So let's start with the arteries. 
they have a narrow lumen. Remember the lumen is the hole in the artery, it's like the hole in a straw. So it's narrow. This clearly means that blood is going to be forced through at a high pressure. Because it's at a high pressure, it means that the walls of the arteries need to be very thick to withstand this pressure. Be nice and detailed here and state that they have thick muscle and elastic fibre walls. Looking at veins now, in veins blood travels at a much lower pressure. This is because veins have a much wider lumen. The walls therefore need to be much thinner, so they have thin muscle and elastic fibre walls. They contain valves and these valves prevent the backflow of blood because that blood sometimes travels so slowly it's liable to start backing up. We don't want that to happen, so the valves force it to move on in the right direction. Capillaries now. Capillaries are the tiny vessels that supply all our cells with oxygen. They are one cell thick and this enables a very short diffusion distance and they have an extremely narrow lumen. Moving on to excretion, so both in plants and humans, obviously when we're talking about humans we'll be really looking at the kidney. Let's start by looking at the definition of excretion. It's the removal of waste products of metabolism from the body. And if we look at the removal of waste products in both photosynthesis and respiration in plants, photosynthesis obviously produces oxygen, so that will be one of the waste gases which is lost through the stomata of the plant leaf. And in respiration, obviously carbon dioxide is produced, so that will be again released out of the stomata. Looking at excretion in humans, what sort of substances are excreted? First of all, sweat from the skin, urea from the kidneys, carbon dioxide from the lungs. Do note that faeces are not excreted, they are ingested, and I already touched on this in the nutrition part of this video. Moving on to the coordination and response topic, again starting with plants, let's first of all discuss the meaning of the word homeostasis. That means the maintaining of a steady internal environment. So, we're going to take plants first of all, and we're going to look at tropisms. First of all, what is a stimulus? And that is a change in the environment. So what sort of stimuluses do plants need to respond to? Clearly they need to respond to the amount of light, and they actually also respond to gravity. So we call a plant's response to light a phototropism, a plant's response to gravity is known as geotropism. So how do organs of a plant react to various tropisms? So let's take phototropism first of all. Clearly a stem shows positive phototropism. Why? Because it grows towards the light. Roots show negative phototropism because they grow away from the light. Let's look at gravity now. Roots obviously show a positive geotropic response because they grow down in the direction of gravity, whereas stems show a negative geotropism because they grow away from gravity. Looking more closely now at how these changes are brought about to the stem and the roots, we need to understand the role of auxins. So what are auxins? Well, they are plant hormones. Let's now explain how a plant stem may bend towards the light, towards the sun, because you do see particularly sunflowers bend towards the sun. That's because the auxins concentrate on the side furthest from the light source. This causes cell elongation on that side, so the cells get longer, and therefore the plant stem bends towards the light. They do like to show you various experiments, and an important part of this will be the coleoptile, which are these really boring little seedlings. Now note that they are cereal seedlings, and they are simple plants used to investigate tropisms. So do be aware of how they respond if you chop their tops off, if you put a mica sheet in between the top of the stem and the bottom of the stem, if you use agar jelly, you do need to know different responses. Lastly, the role of a clinostat. This is another boring piece of equipment. So a clinostat is a device used to remove any stimulus. So for example, it negates the effect of gravity or it negates the effect of sunlight. Now we've touched on plants, so now we need to look at humans and we're talking about the nervous system here. So let's start by looking at, again, what is a stimulus? It is a change in the environment. Now that change in environment is detected by various sense organs and you need to be aware of their names and what they're actually receiving information about. Starting with the eye, that receives light energy. The ear receives sound energy and kinetic energy. The muscles in your skin receive kinetic energy. Your tongue receives chemical energy. So your nose, it also receives chemical energy. Why? Because that's chemicals in food and that's what you smell. 
and then lastly your skin receives kinetic energy and heat energy. So there are two types of communication you need to be aware of, the nervous communication and hormonal communication. So hormones are chemicals which travel in your blood, they send signals and messages to various parts of your body, whereas the nervous system involves the use of electrical impulses. So let's have a quick comparison between the two. First of all, the nervous system is much faster than the hormonal system. Clearly, electrical impulses will get to their location much faster than hormones travelling in the blood. The nervous system involves very localised responses, so the electrical impulse will be locating a very specific effect in muscle, whereas the hormonal system has far wider spread effects. The nervous system responses are short-lived, whereas the hormonal system involves much longer-lived responses. And the last thing, which I've already mentioned, but just to really point it out to you, the nervous system involves electrical impulses, whereas the hormonal system involves the use of chemical messengers. So we're going to take the nervous system in greater detail now. So let's first of all look at what a stimulus is. So that's the change in the environment, and obviously that causes the response that the nervous system brings about. Do be aware of what the central nervous system is. That consists of both the brain and the spinal cord. Let's go through all the steps involved in a regular nervous response, one which does not involve a reflex action. So I'm going to use picking up a book as an example. So first of all we need to list the stimulus, which is seeing or viewing the book. This is picked up by receptors, and these receptors will be in your eyes, your photoreceptors on your retina. They'll send electrical impulses along your sensory neuron to your central nervous system. Electrical impulses then pass along your motor neuron to your effector, and this will be muscles or glands, and in this particular case it will be muscles which will contract to pick up your book. Remember an effect is either a muscle or a gland, so a muscle responds by contracting, a gland responds by secreting hormones. Don't forget the role of the synapse, so the synapse is the gap between two neurons, and this is where a neurotransmitter is released. So the neurotransmitter diffuses across that synaptic gap, that synaptic cleft, and binds to the postsynaptic membrane. So your electrical impulse is changed to a chemical or a neurotransmitter and then changed back to an electrical impulse at a synapse. Looking now at reflex actions, remember these are faster and they are involuntary, so they do not involve a conscious part of your brain, and it tends to be in response to something painful. So taking, putting your hand in the oven and accidentally touching one of the shelves, which is hot, this would trigger a reflex action. So the stimulus this time would be the high temperature from the oven tray. Your receptors would be on your fingers, which would receive that information about it being too hot. Electrical impulses would then flow, again, flow along your sensory neuron to your relay neuron this time. So we're not involving the conscious part of our brains. The electrical impulse passes along the motor neuron to your effector, which will be a muscle in your finger, which contracts to remove your hand or your finger away from that heat source. We need to look a bit more now at the lens. So I've already told you that lens, the lens focuses light onto the retina. It does this by a process of accommodation. We can use this response as an example of a reflex action. So previously I told you all the steps involved in a reflex action, and we're just gonna use those steps, but we're gonna apply them specifically to this example. So I'm gonna use an example which is that we have walked into a very bright room. So the stimulus will be lots of light, the receptor will be the rods and cones on your retina. Then the sensory neuron will pass along the optic nerve to the brain, and there will be a relay neuron. Then we have a motor neuron, which is also passing along the optic nerve, and it will end in an effector. And in this situation, the effector is the muscles which you find in your iris, so your circular and radial muscles. And you'll find that your circular muscles will contract, and your radial muscles will relax and that will act to narrow or constrict the pupil. Let's look at the role of the skin now. So first of all, the skin acts as a barrier, and that actually helps prevent pathogen entry because we often have viruses and bacteria landing on us, but because the skin is such an amazing intact organ, it does actually prevent those microorganisms entering our body. It's also waterproof, which is why you don't swell up when you go swimming. It forms a very tough outer layer just generally to prevent you from physical harm if you knock into something. It's a sense organ for pressure, touch and pain. 
And lastly, it controls our heat loss, how? By either sweating or the hair stand up in order to trap some insulating air close to our bodies. Let's now look at what happens when we're too hot and too cold. So we're looking further at the homeostasis topic, which remember is all about controlling a steady internal environment within our bodies. So let's start by looking at when we are too hot. Well, first of all, an uncomfortable thing happens, which is that we sweat. The reason being that when sweat evaporates, it acts to cool the body. Face the dilation occurs, and that's the arterioles in our face. They dilate, they become wider. What that means is that the blood flows closer to our skin and therefore heat can be radiated more easily. And also when we're too hot, the hairs lie down on our body, on our arms, and that's just so that less insulating air is trapped close to our skin. Because remember, air is a good insulator, it keeps you warm. So by making our hairs lower, it means we're kept less warm. So if we're too cold, clearly our hairs will stand up on end so that more insulating air is trapped close to our skin and that actually acts to keep us warm. We shiver, the reason being that that muscle contraction releases heat energy. And lastly, the opposite of vasodilation occurs, vasoconstriction. The arterioles in our face constrict, they narrow, bringing blood away from the surface of our skin so less heat is radiated. Now looking at a separate hormone, which is adrenaline. Remember that is the fight or flight hormone. It's released in bucket loads when we're under conditions of stress. And it's good to imagine a really angry cat when you're thinking about the effect that adrenaline has on your body. Because if you imagine the cat, then it will actually help you remember every single thing that happens to you when you have adrenaline coursing through your body. So this cat's hairs have stood on end, and that's because it wants to appear scarier to its opponent. Its pupils have dilated, and that's to allow more light into its eyes so it can see more clearly. Its heart rate, not that you can see this, but adrenaline has caused its heart rate and breathing rate to increase. Why? The heart rate increases to deliver blood faster around your body. Your breathing rate increases to allow more oxygen into your body for respiration. Blood is diverted from your digestive system to your active muscles in your arms and your legs and that's so you can either fight or run away if needs be. We are now moving on to reproduction so we'll start by looking at the difference between sexual and asexual reproduction. Hopefully sexual reproduction is nice and straightforward. Clearly you need two parents and it involves gametes. Remember the gametes are eggs and sperm because these are sex cells. So the sperm and egg meet at fertilisation. The first cell formed is known as a zygote, and then it divides by mitosis to form your multicellular organism. And clearly, due to the production of gametes, these offspring will be genetically varied, which is a really important thing to note with sexual reproduction is that it produces genetically varied offspring. So if the environment changes, it means that some individuals will be better adapted whilst others will be less well adapted. And that's when natural selection comes in, but we'll come across that later on in this video. With asexual reproduction, you only need one parent. It's a much quicker process. You end up with genetically identical offspring. And this is why it's good when conditions are unchanging. It's a great way of quickly producing large numbers of identical offspring, which we call clones. There is no gametes, no fertilisation, and no zygote is formed. Some key definitions now. So fertilisation, that's obviously the joining of an egg and a sperm. A zygote is formed, and remember it undergoes mitotic cell division, so lots of mitosis takes place to form two cells, four cells, eight cells, 16 cells. So if they ask you how a 32 cell embryo is formed, sperm and egg, gametes, make sure you include lots of keywords, join at fertilisation, a zygote is formed, it divides by mitosis to form two cells, four cells, eight cells, 16 cells, 32 cells. And that's how you get lots and lots of marks by not writing very much, by including keywords such as gametes, mitosis, etc. Now we're looking at asexual reproduction in plants. The examples you need to know about is a strawberry runner and potato tubers. So these will produce mini plants. You might have seen them on spider plants as well. They'll produce mini plants, which are clones of the original plant, and you can snip them off and transplant them somewhere else. Looking at sexual reproduction now, so obviously we need to look at the structure of a flower, 
how sexual reproduction takes place. So in order to look at reproduction in plants, we obviously need to look at the structure of a flower. You need to know the names of the different parts of the flower and that, know that the flower is separated into both male and female parts. So the male part consists of the anther and the filament. So the filament is actually the thing that supports the anther, whereas the anther contains the pollen grains, and they're essential because they're the male gamete in a plant. The stigma and the style and the ovary are the female parts of the plant. The collective noun for them is the carpal. And everything else is just extra detail that will actually help attract an insect or will help with the wind pollination aspect of sexual reproduction in plants. So now we know about the structure of the flower, that will help us understand what pollination is, fertilisation, etc, etc. So we're now going to look at seed formation. It's important that you know every step involved in this because you could be asked a five marker on this. So first of all, pollen from a male anther will land on the female stigma. A pollen tube will grow down the style and digestive enzymes will help break down the wall of the ovary. At this point, the pollen will meet the ovule, which is the female gamete, and fertilisation takes place. The ovule then goes to form the seed. The ovule wall forms the seed coat. And lastly, the ovary wall will form the fruit. So make sure you list those last steps involved. But first of all, let's understand what we mean by the term pollination. You've got to be super specific here. So remember that the male gamete in a plant is pollen. The female gamete is the egg, but all pollination is, is transferring that pollen to a separate plant. So your perfect definition here is that pollen produced on the anther, which is a male part of the plant, is transferred to the stigma, which is a female part of the plant, on a second plant. And the perfect definition will pop up now so you can see exactly what you need to write. Self-pollination, obviously as the name suggests, that's when the plant does it itself. So that's why pollen from a single plant will land on the stigma of the same plant. Fertilisation now, so remember fertilisation in humans is all to do with sperms and eggs fusing. This time, as we're talking about plants, it's about the pollen fusing with the egg. Looking now at the difference between insect and wind pollinated plants, so let's, when we're talking about the insect pollinated one, think about all the ways in which these flowers, these plants make themselves appealing to insects. So first of all, they have bright, large, colourful petals. These are flag-like structures and they literally draw the insect's attention. So they're like, right, come and pollinate me. Secondly, they have a nectary. The nectary is essential because that's actually why the insect is visiting the plant in the first place. It's not doing the plant a favour, it doesn't give her a damn about the plant. It's simply trying to obtain the sugar from that nectary, which is why insect pollinated plants have a nectary. They have enclosed stigma and anther and what that means is that the insect is forced to rub against the pollen or the stigma when they enter the plant to find the nectary so they're more likely to pick up the pollen. They have a strong scent so that the insect can smell them and that's everything I can think of. Looking now at a wind pollinated plant it's going to be very different from an insect pollinated plant largely because it's the wind blowing that will actually blow that pollen away to a separate plant which is why it makes sense therefore that the anther are very exposed so that when the wind blows, the pollen will literally blow off the plant and be carried by the wind elsewhere. They tend to be dull coloured, have small petals, no scent, for the same reason, because the wind can't see these things because it's wind, so there's no need to have flag-like petals. There'll be an absence of a nectary, again, because the wind doesn't need sugar. They have small petals, small pollen grains, feathery stigma, um, just list these all out and you'll be fine. Next up we need to look at germination. So first of all, what is germination? This is obviously what happens when you plant a seed and it effectively pops out and starts growing, but you need a detailed answer. So first of all, the seed coat bursts. The radical is the name for the small root that appears and that starts to grow downwards. A small shoot will appear and obviously that starts to grow upwards and the seed's food store is used up because the plant can't photosynthesize until it grows its first leaves. In terms of the conditions needed for photosynthesis, remember the mnemonic WOW, standing for warmth, oxygen and water. So all these things are needed in order to enable a seed to germinate. Moving on to the male and female reproductive system in humans now, and there's a new emphasis for you guys on the various roles of different components of the reproductive systems. 
So let's start with the female reproductive system. So starting from the beginning, you've got the vagina, the entrance to the uterus is the cervix, and then branching off the uterus, you've got the fallopian tubes or the oviducts, lastly ending in the ovaries. So what is the role of the ovaries? Well, it's to manufacture eggs. The role of the fallopian tube is to deliver eggs to its entrance, so that's where fertilisation takes place. The uterus is obviously where the zygote embeds. It develops into an embryo, into a growing fetus, and it supports the embryo through the placenta. The cervix is simply the entrance to the uterus, and the vagina is a passage leading out of the woman, and it's where the penis inserts to deposit semen during sexual intercourse. And lastly, the urethra, it's not really to do with the female reproductive system, but do remember it's a separate tube and it transports urine out of the body, so it links to the bladder. Please don't think that a woman urinates out of her vagina. Lots of people seem to be very confused on this. No, there are two separate passageways. Moving on to the male reproductive system now. So we're going to start by looking at the testes or testicles. These manufacture sperm and also the hormone testosterone. They link to the urethra via the sperm duct. The sperm duct is simply a tube which transports semen from the testes to the urethra. The urethra is a tube which links the sperm duct to the outside of the body and in men it transports both semen and also urine. And then lastly there are some glands such as seminal vesicles, some of you may not need to know this, the prostate gland and these just contribute fluid to the semen so that it's not just made up of sperm. Lastly the penis, it passes urine out of the body and deposits semen inside a woman's vagina. Now let's be sensible about this topic and no being silly. <laughs> now we're describing the passage of sperm in the female. So clearly I just said the sperm is deposited in the vagina. It swims through the cervix into the uterus and lastly it swims all the way to the entrance of the oviduct or the fallopian tube where fertilisation actually takes place. So the sperm has a very long way to swim. The role of the placenta, remember this is a huge organ which actually supports the growing fetus, so it provides the fetus with oxygen, digested nutrients such as glucose and amino acids to help it to grow, and it also removes waste products such as urea. Later on in pregnancy it takes over the role of producing the hormone progesterone. And progesterone is a good place to link because we now need to look at the various hormones involved in the female reproductive system. Oestrogen. Oestrogen is produced by the ovaries. It's responsible for secondary sexual characteristics in females. So those are all the changes that occur during puberty, such as breast development, hips widening, pubic hair, armpit hair, all those sorts of things. Sexual drive develops. And its last and very important role is to repair the uterus lining. So it causes it to thicken in preparation for a fertilised egg. Progesterone now, progesterone is produced by firstly the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is just the leftover husk effectively when the egg is ovulated. It's the leftover structure that produces progesterone. Later on in pregnancy, the placenta, as I've already told you, takes over the role. And its role is to maintain the thickness of that uterus lining. Without a thick lining, a woman will miscarry because it really needs to be thick in order to support the growing fetus. And then, because we need to mention men, testosterone, its role is to support the development of secondary sexual characteristics. So again, the puberty changes. This includes pubic hair, armpit hair, widening shoulders, bigger muscles, voice breaking or deepening, sexual drive develops, sperm production occurs. Moving on to the protein synthesis part of the specification, we need to start by looking at some key definitions such as genome and that is the entire DNA belonging to an organism. So we're focusing on, on the nucleus of a cell. Remember that the role of the nucleus is to control the activities of the cell, and it does this because it contains lots of genetic material. So within the nucleus, we know that there are chromosomes. There are 46 chromosomes, which is a diploid number, because remember there are ranges 23 pairs. Remember, half the number of chromosomes is known as a haploid number. However, I digress. I don't really want to talk about that now. So the chromosomes are made up of DNA. You need to know the definition of a gene. A gene is a section of DNA which codes for a particular protein. 
We're going to talk about genetics now, so we need to know the definitions of lots of very key important terms, and then I'm going to show you how to do Pundit squares and pedigree analysis. So let's start by looking at what a gene is. A gene is a section of DNA which codes for a particular protein. Now, there are different genes which control different traits, so for example, eye colour. Now, different forms of the same gene we call alleles, so you must learn that definition. So if we take eye colour, for example, different alleles for eye colour could be blue or brown. You must now know the meaning of the word genotype. The genotype is the alleles an organism has. So, for example, when we're talking about blue eyes, it's two small b's. If we're talking about brown eyes, it could be big B, little b. So when you're asked for genotype, you must provide letters. The phenotype is different. This is the physical appearance of a particular trait. So if you're asked for the phenotype of this eye colour, the answer here is blue. So the genotype would be little b, little b. The phenotype would be blue eyes. So be very aware of that distinction. Next up, we need to know the meanings of homozygous and heterozygous. Homo means same, so it means having two of the same alleles, whether that's two big Bs or two little Bs, it doesn't matter as long as they have the same case. So they both need to be upper or they both need to be lower case, and that is the meaning of the word homozygous. Heterozygous means different, so that means containing different alleles, so in the case of eye colour, that would be a big B and a little B. Now, a dominant trait requires simply the presence of one allele for it to exhibit itself in an individual. So brown is an example of a dominant trait because you can have two big Bs or two, a big B and a little B and the trait will still appear. Recessive requires the absence of the dominant allele. So a recessive trait could be blue eyes because you need two little Bs for example. A blue-eyed mother and heterozygous brown-eyed father decide to try for children. What is the probability that the children will have blue eyes? So let's work out what we have here first of all. Blue-eyed, remember blue is a recessive trait, which means that her genotype must be small b, small b. We've been told that the father is brown-eyed, which means he could be big b, small b, or big b, big b. But the fact that he is heterozygous tells us that he must be big B, small b, and not big B, big b. So I'll show you how to lay out your answer. This is the method you should always use. So start by writing mother and father at the top. And we know how much I love tables. So you're going to write in your table phenotype, genotype, and lastly gametes. Remember, these are sperm and eggs. So, the phenotype. This is the physical appearance. We can see from the description that the mother has blue eyes. And the father has brown eyes. The genotype. So, these are the alleles that each parent has. I've already written these out. So, it's small b, small b, big b, little b. The gametes, just split these up because this is saying what the eggs and sperm will be. So just write out what you wrote on the genotype layer. But put circles around them to show that they're gametes. Because here are the sperm and the mothers are eggs. And now we need to do the Punnett square. So mother, father. I don't know why my iPad sometimes undoes what I've done already. So she's small b, small b, he's big b, little b. Let's cross them. So big b, small b, big b, small b, small b, small b. And therefore, both of these will have blue eyes. Both of these will have brown eyes. So as a percentage likelihood, it's 50% will have blue eyes and 50% will have brown eyes. Cystic fibrosis is a recessive disease. A carry mother and a carry father decide to try for children. What is the probability that their child will have cystic fibrosis? So it's recessive, which means to have the disease, you need this genotype, small c, small c. It doesn't matter what letter you use to assign, by the way, but I'm using c here because of cystic fibrosis. A carrier mother and a carrier father, 
that automatically tells me that this is their genotype and you must learn that they're effectively heterozygous if they are carriers. So we've worked out their genotypes so we're ready to do the genetic cross by writing mother and father at the top again. Phenotype, genotype and gametes in the table. The phenotype is that they are both carriers. Their genotype we know is heterozygous, so it's big C, small c. This means that half of her eggs will be big C, half of them will be small c, and the same with the sperm. And make sure you really show difference in the size of your letters here. And now it's time to do the Punnett square. So this child is big C, big C, so they'll be healthy. This child is big C, small C, so they'll be carriers, but they'll still be healthy. Same for this one. And lastly, this child here will have cystic fibrosis. So they have a 25% chance of having a child with CF. So now we need to look at pedigree diagrams and the best way to do this is by showing you an example. Always use this approach and do notice these are supposed to be really difficult so don't worry too much if you're finding it too much. Question 3. Familial hypercholesteremia FH is an inherited condition caused by a dominant allele. That is key. People with the condition have high levels of cholesterol in their blood increasing the risk of dying from blocked arteries. The diagram shows the pattern of inheritance in several generations of a family with familial hypocholesteremia. So do notice with the pedigree diagram that the squares are always the men in the family. You'll know this from the key. The circles always represent females. And in this case from the key, we can see that the gray shaded boxes are sufferers of FH, whilst the white boxes or circles are non-sufferers. So person A is heterozygous for FH. Use this information to complete the table. So let's start by labeling the genotype of, F, of person A. And we are going to use the letter D. I mean, it doesn't matter what letter you use, but I'm going to use the letter D because you can easily see the difference between a capital D and a small d. So labeling their genotype, this is what they look like. So labeling their genotype, this is what they look like. So big D, small d. So what is the question actually asking? How many people have the genotype which is homozygous recessive? So homozygous recessive. Homozygous meaning the same case. Recessive meaning lowercase, which is why we're looking for small d, small d here. Homozygous dominant. Homozygous meaning the same. Dominant meaning that they're both capital. So that's what we're looking for. Now we're going to work out what the pedigree diagram tells us. First of all, I'm going to look at all the people without FH. So all the people that are either white circles or white squares. Because they don't have the disease, I know therefore that they are small d, small d. So I can just label all of their genotypes straight away. And now we need to count them to work out the number of people with the genotype homozygous recessive. And once I've done that, I can see that it is 11. Now we're getting slightly more difficult by looking for the big D, big D, so homozygous dominant. So we need to infer things from the pedigree analysis. First of all, look at woman C. So she got her genotype from parents A and B. Now B is homozygous recessive, which means they must have passed on a small d. She has the disease, which means she must have a big d. So this is her genotype. E has the same issue, but they're a man. So they're going to be big d, small d. Person G inherited a small lowercase allele from D. They have the disease, which is why they're capitalized. And the same goes for person J. And then looking at NOP, well, they inherited a small d from their mother. They have the disease, which is why they have a big D. So actually, looking for people with big D, big D, the answer here is zero. Person G and H have three children, all, who, all of whom have FH. What is the probability of G and H having three children who all have FH? This is a crazy amount of work for one mark, because the only way I can see of doing this is to draw Punnett square. So we're going to do a Punnett square for G and H using my layout I already described. So we're looking at the phenotype, genotype and gametes. If 
from the key, we can see that person G has FH. H is therefore healthy from the key. We've already labelled their genotypes, so we can just copy that directly across and then separate these out to see the gametes. Now just simply do a cross. And it's these two here that will have FH. Now, what is 50% as a probability? Well, it's 0 0.5. And the question asks the probability of all three children having FH. So remember, when we're talking about probability, we have to multiply together our probabilities. Pop that into your calculator, and you'll get a value which is 0 0.125. Let's look at mitosis and meiosis now. So remember, they're both types of cell division, but they're used for making very different things. So meiosis is used to make gametes. So that means it's used to make sperms and egg. Mitosis is a completely different type of cell division. You need to learn that it's used in cloning, asexual reproduction, and the growth and repair of cells. So for example, if you damage yourself, you cut yourself, it will be mitotic cell division, which replaces those cells. If you're carrying out asexual reproduction, so something like a strawberry runner producing baby strawberry plants, that will involve mitosis. The reason being is that it creates genetically identical offspring. I don't think you really need to know this, but some teachers like to just chat slightly about the different stages involved in mitosis and meiosis. I'm really only going to give you their names, and the first stage is prophase, the second stage is metaphase, then anaphase, and finally telophase, but this is a revision video and I'm not willing to talk about it anymore at this point because I don't think it's necessary for lots of you. So let's look at the differences between mitosis and meiosis. I always do this as a table because it make, allows me to make a direct comparison. So look at the number of cell divisions first of all. That will be one cell division in mitosis, two cell divisions in meiosis. The number of daughter cells now, so that's the number of cells produced once this cell division has taken place. In mitosis, you're looking at two daughter cells. In meiosis, you're looking at four daughter cells. I've already touched on the sorts of cells that are produced, but just to recap, mitosis produces genetically identical daughter cells, meiosis produces genetically varied daughter cells, which makes sense. If we're using mitosis in cloning, that's genetically identical. If we're using meiosis in making gametes, it makes sense that we want our sperms and eggs to all be different to each other. And do notice that the gametes will contain a haploid number of chromosomes, whereas the daughter cells produced by mitosis will contain a diploid number. Don't forget that haploid means containing one set of chromosomes, so in humans that is 23. Diploid means containing two sets of chromosomes, in humans that is 46. Looking at species now, so what is the definition of a species? Well, it's individuals which can reproduce to produce fertile offspring, and that's key. It's all very well having a horse and a donkey and they mate and they produce an offspring, which we call a mule, but the mule is sterile, it cannot reproduce. So that's the crucial thing about members of the same species, they can reproduce together to produce fertile offspring. Lyra! Hey! Soggy. Where's it? Where isn't it focusing? You're so soggy. Is it wet out there? Super soggy. So, how is variation within a species brought about? Because we know the human race isn't full of billions of people that all look the same. That is brought about by a combination of things. First of all, genetics and secondly, environmental factors. So two identical twins, regardless of the fact they have the same genes, if you move them to opposite parts of the world, it's very likely they'll have different heights, different masses, different, slightly different skin color, and that's due to the environment they experience. That could be lots of sun, one of them could eat more, one of them could do less exercise. You all right? Are you too muddy? You're powering, aren't you? This makes a change. What is a mutation? It's a rare random change to the genetic material of an organism. 
very short topic now on evolution and natural selection. So first of all, your definition for evolution. It states that many organisms which are alive today and many more which are now extinct first evolved from very simple life forms that first evolved over 3.2 billion years ago. So that's basically saying that evolution states that we all evolved from small life forms like bacteria, which became multicellular, which became more and more complicated. They became reptiles, they became birds, and then they became mammals, and then we came about. So that's really what evolution is stating. Natural selection links very nicely with this. Remember, this is Charles Darwin's theory. Now, he stated, and I do just want you to learn this as a five mark answer off by heart. He stated that there is variation within a species due to mutation, which is what I've just discussed. So within a species, that is variety. This means that some individuals within the species are more likely to survive because they are better adapted. Because they're surviving, they're likely to reproduce, so produce offspring, and those offspring will inherit those favorable genes. So before you know it, you have many generations that go past and they've all inherited this favorable gene, making them more likely to survive. And I'm now gonna bring up that perfect answer for you. Natural selection can be seen pretty much everywhere on Earth, including bacteria. So we're just going to describe how bacteria may become antibiotic resistant and it does link to natural selection. So what happens is you have a colony of bacteria, you give them an antibiotic and due to mutations, some of those bacteria are stronger. They are resistant. That means they are not killed by the antibiotic. So what happens is all the other bacteria are killed, leaving behind these very strong antibiotic resistant bacteria they soon replicate and before you know it, you've got a colony of bacteria which is no longer treatable using antibiotics. And that's why everyone's so scared about antibiotic resistance and what it means for our future medicine. Ecology now, not my favorite topic, mainly because it's full of disgusting definitions which all seem to be very similar and all sound the same. So let's start by looking at the definition of environment. That is the total non-biological components of an ecosystem so we're looking at the soil and the water, for example. The habitat is the place where a specific organism lives. Now population, be very specific with your keywords here. This is all the organisms belonging to a particular species which you find within an ecosystem. What is the community? This is the population of all species found within a particular ecosystem. Now what is a producer? Because remember producers start all food chains and food webs. This is just a plant which photosynthesizes to produce its own food. A consumer is an animal which eats other animals or plants. What is a decomposer? It's an organism which decays dead material and helps to recycle nutrients. Define a parasite. This is an organism which lives within another organism, causing harm to that organism and feeding off of them. What is a predator? It's an animal which kills and eats another animal. Gosh, these definitions do keep coming. What are biotic factors? These are living factors, so these are, fact these are living factors which affect organisms' lives, so it could be other animals competing for food, competing for nesting sites, bringing disease and pathogens to other organisms. Abiotic factors are non-living factors which affect organisms such as soil pH, temperature of water, carbon dioxide availability, number of daylight hours, etc. So now we've looked at all the definitions, we now need to look at how we're going to sample an ecosystem. So say we've got a big field and we want to know about the variety of species living there, how are we going to do that? And we are going to use a quadrat. So remember that is a big metal frame which you're going to place randomly on the field and you're going to take a sample of the organisms you can find within it. Make sure you can draw a quadrat, it's not a complicated diagram, just draw a nice metal grid and be prepared to state how you would use it. So first of all you need to place it randomly using a random number generator because what you do remember is you get a field, you effectively mark it out with imaginary squares and then you use your random number generator to work out where to place that quadrat. Don't say throw it because that's really biased, it means that it will ping off to the left or the right. Um, so don't say throw the quadrat you're going to write down all the species you find within the quadrat, and then you're simply going to repeat and place it in many other places around the field, so you've got a really good feel of the place. Looking more closely now at pyramids of numbers and pyramids of biomass, so remember a pyramid of numbers simply shows you the number of each organism at each trophic level. So a trophic level is just the stage in a food chain. So for example, a pyramid of numbers could start with grass, 
the grass could be eaten by rabbits, so that will be the next tier. And lastly, you'll have foxes. But we don't like using pyramids and numbers because often they end up looking a really strange shape and not being pyramidal at all. And that can be due to the producer only being one organism, such as a tree. That will be very small in comparison to the number of sparrows living on it, which is why you end up with very funny shaped pyramids. So we use pyramids of biomass because that actually shows the mass of living material available and therefore the oak tree for example will appear much larger and therefore the pyramid will be the correct shape. Why is so little energy passed from one organism to another? So for example from the producer to the primary consumer. So let's take grass, the producer and a rabbit as an example. Remember the rabbit is the primary consumer. The issue here is that only part of the grass is digestible, much of it passes out of the rabbit as faeces. Some of the grass isn't eaten, so the rabbit won't even eat the roots. I don't know if that's true, but it can be a reason. The rabbit moves, it keeps itself warm, it respires, it ingests, I've already mentioned this, it poos. So these are all ways in which energy is lost within a food chain. In fact, 90% is lost at each stage of the food chain. If they ask you where all that energy originates from, remember that is the sun. The diagram shows a food web from a habitat. Use information in the food web to complete the table. The first one has been done for you. This has been drawn quite horribly. So rather than looking at where the layers are, you'll need, you're going to need to count the arrows and make sure you remember things about what a producer is and what a primary consumer is. So starting with the number of organisms, which they've done for us, which is annoying because that's the easy question. Just count how many different organisms there are. There are eight, so we do agree with them. The number of different types of plant. You're looking for the producers here. So what here is a plant? Well, you can see from the picture, even if you don't know what a cattail is, that it's a cattail and marsh grass. So the answer here is two. The number of animals. So these are the animals which form anything from the primary, secondary, tertiary, consumer level. So the animals, therefore, are grasshopper, cricket, shrew, frog, snake and hawk. And if you count those up, you'll get six number of primary consumers so remember they appear straight after the producers so we've got an arrow leading to the cricket and the grasshopper which is why the answer here is two number of food chains god this is more difficult so food chain one will be marsh grass grasshopper shrew hawk food chain two is the same but includes the snake before the hawk so that will be the second one Food chain three is the cattail, cricket, shrew, hawk. Food chain four will be the same but include the snake. And then food chain five will include cattail, cricket, frog, snake and hawk. So that was pretty tricky but the answer here is five. The plants in this food web make the food for some of the animals to eat. Give the name used to describe these plants. I've already mentioned that a lot. That is a producer. The hawk catches and eats its prey. Give the name used to describe the hawk in this food web. So I told you earlier in my definitions that something that catches and eats something is a predator. A pesticide can be used to kill the grasshoppers in this habitat. Describe the effect that killing grasshoppers would have on the number of shrews. So we need to have a look. Oh right, so the grasshoppers are eaten by the shrews. So clearly if we reduce the number of grasshoppers, the number of shrews will reduce because there is less food for them. Describe the effect that killing grasshoppers would have on the number of marsh grass plants. So if we have fewer grasshoppers, we can see that they won't be eating the marsh grass as much, which means that the marsh grass population will increase. Let's do the carbon cycle now. I do like this topic. If you just learn it as a list of steps, it's far easier than learning it as the whole cycle, unless you're a very artistic kind of pictorial person because I really struggle in that way but I find learning this list of steps works well every time. So we're looking at how carbon is cycled in our atmosphere and within living organisms. So the place I like to always start is carbon dioxide in the air. So what happens to that carbon dioxide in the air? Well it gets absorbed by green plants in photosynthesis and it is used to make glucose. Those green plants then respire because they're living organisms and that releases carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So here's the first step of CO2 moving in, CO2 moving out. The plants are eaten by animals and so that carbon that was part of the plants becomes parts of, part of the animal body. And then the animal respires again, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. 
Lastly, plants and animals inevitably die, and then this is where decomposers come in. They break down that dead material, and they respire, again releasing carbon dioxide. So we can see carbon dioxide went in in the first place with green plants photosynthesizing, and then it left via respiration by plants, animals, and microorganisms. Do notice that combustion, which is burning of fuels and things, also releases carbon dioxide into the air. Let's now look at human impact on the environment and we're going to start with eutrophication which is an effect brought about when farmers use too much fertilizer on their land and when sewerage, this is disgusting, washes into rivers and streams and lakes. So do remember fertilizers and sewerage contain a lot of nitrates. So what happens is the plants use those nitrates to build proteins and they grow extremely quickly. Because they've grown so quickly, they end up dying. The reason for this is due to lack of light. Basically, they, they block all the light for each other and they die because they can't photosynthesize. My next have gone. The death of the plants obviously provides lots of food for decomposers and microorganisms. So they grow hugely in number because they're feeding on this dead material. Because they're aerobic respirers, they use up all the oxygen in the water courses, and this means there's no oxygen available for aquatic animals, and they die, and that's how leaching of nutrients, of fertilizers and sewage can end up with death of all aquatic animals within water courses. The greenhouse effect now, we're, the greenhouse effect is very famous, we're always talking about it because of environmental change. Do you remember this is due to human activity, or we think it's due to human activity, so burning of fossil fuels, which releases carbon dioxide. Other greenhouse gases include methane. Do you remember sources of methane? So some of that comes from the digestion of bovine animals such as cows. Effectively, when they fart and burp, that's disgusting, they release lots of methane. Rice paddy fields, the microorganisms that are found in rice paddy fields contribute an awful lot of methane to the atmosphere. And remember, the other two greenhouse gases you need to know about are water vapour and nitrous oxide. So there are four greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide and water vapour. So what effect does this increase in greenhouse gas have on the environment? What you find is that the whole of the Earth's atmosphere heats up and this leads to widespread melting of the polar ice caps. This means much more water is added to our seas and oceans and consequently you get a rise in sea level. This floods low-lying land, so towns and cities close to the coast, and it will automatically lead to loss of biodiversity because animals have less habitat, less places to live in, and you can see extinction of some species. We also are seeing a knock-on effect with extreme weather, huge storms, typhoons, etc. This is all a result of enhanced greenhouse effect and global warming. There's a change in bird migration patterns because it's getting warmer throughout the year, so they're confused as to what month it is, because obviously they don't know the month, they just base their migration on the temperature. So we see a real change in bird migration patterns. We're going to touch now on CFCs. Remember we find these in aerosols and fridges, although much less now, they're supposed to be banned. The reason being is because they damage the ozone layer. And the ozone layer is important because it protects us from the sun's UV rays. Acid rain, you need to know about in GCSE chemistry. Remember it originates because of sulfur impurities in petrol, which when burnt, release sulfur dioxide into the air. The high temperatures found in car engines, cause the nitrogen and oxygen in air to react, again forming nitrogen oxides. So nitric acid and sulfuric acid is produced, which are components of acid rain. So what effect does acid rain have on the environment? Well, first of all, it damages trees and it can literally dissolve away their leaves. It damages limestone buildings. And lastly, it gets into lakes and rivers and makes them too acidic. It's quite a bitty topic because we're again going to move on and now we're looking at carbon monoxide. Just remember that carbon monoxide is again released by car engines and it combines irreversibly with the haemoglobin found in red blood cells, meaning that they can no longer transport oxygen and that's why carbon monoxide is such a toxic, poisonous gas. We need to look at the use of biological resources, so this is food production, starting with a look at greenhouses and how they increase crop yield. Remember crop yield is just about how many plants or vegetables or flowers that a farmer is able to grow. So we use greenhouses, glass houses, polytunnels etc. Also that we can increase the amount of product or plant that we can grow. So 
why does using a greenhouse increase the amount of plants we can grow? Because first of all, you can artificially control the temperature. So in the cold winter months, you can add heaters and they heat up the atmosphere, which increases the rate of photosynthesis. More photosynthesis means more crops. Don't forget as well that the glass actually traps some of the heat energy from the sun. So you end up with an enhanced greenhouse effect actually going on inside the greenhouse, which again increases the temperature. You can control the carbon dioxide levels, water levels, etc. So you can make sure that none of these is a limiting factor. And the water levels that you can do by increasing the humidity inside the greenhouse. By increasing the humidity, what you're actually doing is reducing the rates of transpiration, which I've already touched on earlier in this video. And lastly, light. Light is a limiting factor of photosynthesis, especially in the winter when there's more dark hours. You can literally add electric lighting so the plants carry on photosynthesizing throughout the day and also the night. So we're looking for maximum growth here. What effect does increasing the carbon dioxide and temperature have on crop yield? Well, this is obvious. Increasing both of these will increase the crop yield. Why? Because increasing temperature means that the enzymes involved in photosynthesis have more kinetic energy, so they catalyze reactions faster. Obviously, don't forget that if the temperature gets too hot, they will be denatured. So there's always a sweet spot, an optimum temperature, which must be used. And then the carbon dioxide, of course, that is a reactant involved in photosynthesis. So if we increase the levels of CO2, then we increase the rate of photosynthesis. This is a bit of a repeat of what I was just talking about, but it is a separate specification point, which is why I'm addressing it here. So how does using fertilizers increase crop yield? Well, the addition of fertilizers to the soil replaces leached or lost nitrates and mineral ions from the soil, because remember, fertilizers are very rich in nitrogen, nitrates, and those nitrates are used by plants to build proteins. What is a pesticide? Remember, it is a chemical which kills pests, so anything which feeds off plants will be counted as a pest. Killing pests obviously reduces their damage to the crop and it also helps to increase crop yield. Looking at how we control pests further, remember we can add chemicals, so pesticides, or we can use biological control, which is about using other animals which kill and eat the pests and we need to look at their various advantages and disadvantages. So let's first of all at look at the advantages of using pesticides. Now these are easy to use, so they're easy to apply. They're effective, which means they do a pretty good job of killing the pests, and they're readily available. Issues though, there's lots of issues with using pesticides. Firstly, that they can be very expensive. They're persistent, which means it takes a while for them to decompose. So once you apply them to your soil, you've got to be aware that they may hang around for many, many years. And the problem here is that they can often kill animals which aren't even pests, which is really, really bad because these are innocent animals getting killed by the pesticides because the pesticide does not discriminate correctly. So what happens here is it kills other animals. Some of these animals get eaten by large animals, so we're talking about food chains here. And this is called bioaccumulation, where the pesticides become stored in these animals. And then as this pesticide works itself up the food chain, we call this biomagnification. And the famous case study of this is DDT, which was used to eradicate malaria and typhoid in the Second World War. And there are still areas of the world where DDT is killing huge amounts of flora and fauna. And that just means animals and plants. Another disadvantage is that you have to keep reapplying this pesticide. Looking at biological control now, so let's name a few examples. So like I said before, this is using animals to kill pests. The most famous one probably is using ladybirds because ladybirds are predators to aphids. So they come along and munch on the aphids, which would otherwise be destroying things like cabbages. So what are the advantages of using ladybirds using biological control? Well, they tend to be quite specific and kill the pests that you're after. Secondly, they're self-sustaining. They tend to reproduce, which is great because you don't have to keep reapplying ladybirds. They tend to grow into new populations, which will continue to eat the aphids. And clearly, they'll be non-toxic, especially when compared with things like DDT. However, there are disadvantages. They have been known to not just eat the pests that you're after. They can go around eating other things, so that can be both an advantage and a disadvantage. They never fully eradicate the pests. So there will still be some aphids which survive the purge because the ladybirds don't go and eat all of them. When you add extra animals to an environment, to an ecosystem, they can have undesired effects. You don't really know what they're going to do. They can have major effects on food chains. They really disrupt them. 
So you do have to be careful before you decide to apply these animals to your ecosystem. And lastly, compared with using pesticides, it's pretty damn slow waiting for ladybirds to go and eat all the aphids, whereas with pesticides you tend to find that everything gets wiped out immediately. Right, looking at microorganisms involved in food production, so primarily yeast. So how is yeast used in bread making? Don't forget that yeast is a fungus. When it's forced to respire anaerobically, it breaks down glucose or it respires glucose into carbon dioxide and ethanol. That carbon dioxide is very important in bread making. It creates bubbles, which actually helps that bread dough to rise. Looking at the role of yeast in beer making, so the anaerobic respiration of yeast, remember that produces ethanol, I've just told you that, and ethanol is an alcohol, so that's where the alcohol found in beer originates. I think there's been a change in emphasis with the new specification, so with yogurt making, I'm not going to talk too much about it, just be aware that the bacterium Lactobacillus bulgaricus is used, it carries out anaerobic respiration, breaking down lactose, which is the sugar found in yogurt, into lactic acid, which gives yogurt that very distinctive flavour, and that can be done inside a fermenter. Moving on to fermenters, so what is a fermenter? Well, it's a vessel which contains microorganisms which are involved in fermentation reactions. So let's describe the structure of a fermenter and how it is optimized to ensure as much of the product is produced as possible. So first of all, we control the temperature, and that's through a cooling jacket, because microorganisms, when they respire, produce a lot of heat. And if too much heat is produced, then they can denature the enzymes and actually kill themselves. So the cooling jacket has cold water flowing around it, which helps to remove excess heat from the fermenter. Coupled with this, you have temperature and pH monitors, because obviously you need to determine if the temperature is too high, you need to determine if the pH is too alkaline or acidic. So it's, it's important that we keep watch on the fermenter. We also have stirring paddles to mix up the contents and that ensures that the nutrients and heat are evenly distributed. You often have an air inlet, not always, but sometimes, and that's to allow oxygen into the fermenter for any microorganisms which respire aerobically. And lastly, nutrient supply, because obviously the microorganisms need something to respire. Now, selective breeding. So remember, this is when humans use animals or plants with desired characteristics. They force them to breed and then they repeat this process over many generations. So before you know it, you have animals with desired characteristics. So if we're looking at animals, let's, for example, look at the dairy industry. So dairy cows, clearly a good animal here will produce a lot of milk. So at humans, so make sure you point out that it's humans, they select a dairy cow that produces a high yield of milk. They mate her with a bull, it's quite hard to determine the bull because obviously they don't produce milk, but they'll mate her with a bull. And then her calves are likely to produce more milk, the female calves, because of their high yield mother. Then you take those calves and you keep repeating the process until you have lots of calves and lots of cows that produce lots of milk. And you can do the same with plants. So you can selectively breed plants to be a particular colour. So you pick flowers that are a particular colour. You force them to cross-pollinate. And then before you know, you've got a load of plants with your desired characteristics, such as petal colour. Genetic engineering now. This is quite a complicated topic. It is chock-a-block full of key scientific words, but if you learn them off by heart, you should be fine. So remember we genetically engineer things like insulin. So insulin is a hormone produced by our pancreas and it's responsible for lowering our blood sugar levels after we've eaten. And for type 1 diabetics, they find that they don't produce insulin, so they really struggle to maintain their blood sugar levels, which is where genetic engineering comes in because in the olden days they used to obtain pig insulin, so they used to chop into pigs, remove the insulin, and not only do you have major ethical issues with this, but obviously the insulin wasn't particularly fit for purpose because it came from pigs. So it was important that we found a way of producing insulin from humans, and so that's where genetic engineering came in. And when we're talking about genetic engineering, we're talking about using bacterial cells, because bacterial cells contain small rings of genetic information called plasmids, which we can manipulate so that you can insert the insulin gene and force the bacteria to produce lots of insulin. So let's go into great detail how that is done. So we obtain the bacterial cell and we cut open the plasmid using a restriction enzyme. 
which acts as a pair of biological scissors. Then we use a restriction enzyme to cut the insulin gene away from the rest of the cell and we insert that insulin gene into that bacterial plasmid using a ligase enzyme and we stick it together and that's why we say it has sticky ends. Once we've done that, we're ready to put the bacterial cell into a fermenter and it's been done many, many times. And then I've already mentioned the fermenter and you need to provide it with the optimum conditions, so the right temperature, the right pH, the optimum amount of oxygen and nutrients, etc. And before you know it, your bacteria has made huge amounts of insulin. Don't forget a few key words here concerning genetic engineering. Once that plasmid has a different gene inserted into it, we call it a recombinant plasmid, which means it's been recombined, so it's been changed. And don't forget also that the bacterial cell, the plasmid is acting as a vector, which means it transports biological material from one place to another. So I've already given the bacterial plasmid as an example, and we met a different example earlier on in this video when I mentioned malaria. The mosquito is the vector when we're talking about malarial infection because it carries the plasmodium, remember that's the protoctus that causes malaria, from one organism to another. Be prepared to give those lists of steps for any named human protein. We can also genetically modify plants so that they can have desired characteristics. This could include being frost resistant, so that stops them dying when frost hits in winter. It could be to extend their shelf life to stop them going off so that they have a longer shelf life and are more fit for human consumption after many days. You might actually want to make plants resistant to weed killers. This sounds really strange because why would you want to make a plant resistant to weed killer? But think about it. A farmer applies the weed killer. By the way, the best name for weed killer is herbicide. Side meaning kill, herb meaning to plants. So the farmer applies the herbicide. He or she wants to kill the weed However, some of it will inevitably fall on the plant that they're trying to grow and obviously you don't want that to happen because it will actually kill the plant you're trying to grow. So if you can make that crop plant resistant to herbicide, then that's great because you apply that herbicide or weed killer, it kills the weeds and your actual plant that you're after stays alive and continues to grow. You can also genetically modify plants so that they can actually have health benefits one of the most famous examples of this is golden rice. So when poorer countries grow lots of rice, unfortunately rice doesn't have a huge amount of nutritional value. So what you can do is genetically modify it so that it contains vitamin A. And therefore when people eat that rice, they, they get a huge amount of vitamin A in their diet and that stops them getting night blindness. This is something you should remember from the balanced diet topic of the specification. So golden rice is an excellent example where genetic modification has been used really well. And then the most strange example of genetic modification is when we talk about tobacco plants. And these have been modified so they actually produce hepatitis antigens. Therefore have a potential vaccine against hepatitis. So this is like crazy science, but just remember that tobacco plants may be modified to produce hepatitis vaccines. So we've already touched on this, we've given lots of examples of genetic modification in plants. Just to reiterate the advantages and to throw in a few more, you can have increased salt tolerance. Let's now define a transgenic organism, and that's where genes have been transferred from one species to another, such as in goats. They've had a gene from spiders inserted into them so that when they produce milk, they actually produce spider webs. This is crazy, but it's actually true because spider web is so strong, even when compared with steel, if you made a spider web as large as a steel frame, you would find the spider web was much stronger. So that's why scientists are interested in working out artificial ways of manufacturing spider web. I digress, don't worry about this too much. The point here to notice is that a transgenic organism is one that has had a gene inserted into it from another organism. Right, I hope you found my video helpful guys. These are so difficult to make, but I know you guys really like to just sit and watch the whole thing in one. So please give me a like. Like this video if you found it helpful. It is a good incentive for me to continue my work. And don't forget to sub. So we're done, well done for staying all this way. I'm really impressed if you managed to watch the video all in one. Don't forget about my revision guides. My perfect answer revision guides are available on my website right now at www.sciencewithhazel.co.uk. You can click on this card to buy yourself a copy of my revision guide, which makes the perfect accompaniment to these videos.